You want to look at some homework questions. Let me remind myself what some of those look like. So first thing um, is I want to do one. Also, yeah, hopefully is. Do, do, do. Do. I don't see Zach yet, so I can't ask him about SI yet, but he'll hopefully be here in another minute or so, maybe. Um, I assume he'll be having a, uh, a review, but anyway. Um, one of the first things I'll go over is um, a type of homework question, because remember there's some homework questions with the integrals that um, you have to do by hand because it wants the exact answer and not a, um, a decimal answer. So one type of those would be something like, um, I might not do an exact problem from the homework, but something like uh, 4e to the 2t dt. And so this is kind of 6-3 material here. So if we want to do these by hand, remember that even though you can punch this into a calculator, the way we do it by hand is that we need to take the, yeah, this is essentially the fundamental theorem of calculus, the one where it essentially is telling us that to calculate these, we essentially find the antiderivative and then plug in the top bound and subtract what we get when we plug in the bottom bound. Exactly. So here, if I wanted to do this by hand, the first thing I need is the general antiderivative. So essentially that four comes along for the ride. And then when we wanna take the antiderivative of e to the um, two t, that's essentially an e to the kx situation type of deal. So we get that e to the kx or e to the two t in this situation. And then remember you have to divide or multiply by a fraction um, of that k value. So we're gonna have to multiply by one half. And then you always get a plus C at the end of your antiderivatives. And so I can clean that up a little bit. Once you have the antiderivative, you want to plug in your top bound. So we would take our top bound of 2 and plug it in where we see a T. And we would subtract what we get when we plug in 0 for a T. So in Wiley, what you would need is we can clean this up a little bit. So 2e to the fourth. Now, technically, let me just write this out fully. And then e to the zero. And then don't forget that you have to distribute that negative. So the c's cancel each other out. That kind of just always happens. So you get 2e to the fourth minus 2. Now, e to the zero, anything to the zeroth power is 1. So 2 times e to the zero is just 2. So for a question like this in Wiley, this is what it would be looking for, not a decimal. Um, so there's a couple like that. There's also a couple where you need to make sure it's in a fraction form instead of a decimal form. So be really careful in the sixth three material. Um, they don't want decimals, they want actual answers. And yes, I know you can type some of them into your calculator, but you should probably do them by hand for the practice. <laughs> um, but, let me also take a side note and show you how to type it into your calculator just in case. Um, because say this came up on, well, you wouldn't have one exactly like this because there's not really e to the whatever's in area questions, not the ones that I ask. Anyway, um, say this was in an area question, then this is fair game to type into your calculator for those types of questions. So remember, actually, um, since you're the one who asked, Gwen, do you have a TI-84 or an 83? Because if you have something different, then we'll need to talk about your specific calculator. But do you have one of these guys? OK, cool. Um, let me sh pull up my key history. So there's the key history on the bottom if you forget what I press. But you hit the math button, which is right below that alpha. And then you can either scroll down to number nine or you can just hit nine on like the number pad. And it should pull up this unless you have an older 84. Do you have an older 84 or is this what you see? Sorry, I keep asking you questions. <laughs> okay. 
Gwen. You have a C, okay. So it should look like this probably, I believe. So when it looks like this, now you essentially just plug the things in the right spot. So if we wanna do essentially the thing I was just calculating over here, we would need, um, so zero to two. So we put zero and you can use the little arrow keys to scroll to the next box and then two and scroll over. Four, the E is above the division symbol. So you wanna do second divide carrot. Now this is important. So here in the question, it says T, you don't need to worry about matching the variable. So what you're gonna use when you wanna use a variable is you're going to use this button that's now highlighted in red. It's like second column, second row kind of deal. So whenever you want to use a variable, you want to use that button and then you can scroll over to that last box. And in here again, you want to use that variable button to plug in. And so of course this isn't going to give you that answer. It's going to give you the decimal answer. But if we check ourselves, our answer was not that was two, two e to the fourth minus two. So we got the right answer. <laughs> so that's how you type it in your calculator math nine and then you just kind of fill it out and make sure whenever you want to use a variable um, you use that variable button. Um, Okay, so Grace, you're also asking about homework. So um, the last one in Wiley is kind of like one I just did where you have to do it by hand. Um, it's a tiny bit more complicated because it's got a decimal in there. But um, if it's something like, like I don't know what yours is, but mine's this. This is what's pulling up for me. Your antiderivative would be the same idea. You would just be dividing by a decimal and then you just punch that sucker into your calculator. The one over thing, not the integral. So your um, uh, antiderivative would be this and then you do the same kind of idea, plug in the top bound, plug in the bottom bound um, kind of deal. But you also wanted to talk about the first one. Okay, that's a good one. Okay, so the first one on Wiley was, now it might not be your exact problem, but we'll go over a problem like the first one. Um, so say I want to find the area under, ooh, uh, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm dumb. Um, under the graph of f of x equals, it's giving me x squared plus three, so we'll go with that. Again, yours might be slightly different, it changes for everybody. Between x equals zero and x equals six. So this is gonna be a 5.3 kind of deal. So we're finding the area underneath of that graph between zero and six. Excuse me. So this is an area question. So that's when we have that kind of very long um, drawn out process, if you will. Now, since we're not given an official second equation, that's when we're using y equals zero as the second one. We're finding essentially the area between that function and the x axis. So the first thing you want to do is find when they intersect. So we have got to find where they intersect each other. So we take x cubed plus nope x squared. So this one's gonna be a little gross. Wait, no, does that not intersect at all? Oh, okay. If you started to solve this, you would get x squared equals three. Sorry, negative three, which for our intents and purposes doesn't happen uh, in our class. We don't deal with imaginary numbers, so this just doesn't happen. So if they never intersect, then you just go over the interval that they give you. So they give us an interval from zero to six. So we don't need to split it up at all. So we just need to find the integral from zero to six of 
whatever we're working with. So essentially now we just jump to finding which one's on top of the other. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that one, um, yeah, those numbers kind of don't exist for our intents and purposes. So we need to find out which one's on top of the other. So since we're going between zero and six, if I wanna do this algebraically, I can pick a number between zero and six, like one. And if I plug one into zero, well, there's nowhere to plug it in, so I get zero. And if I plug it into, why do I keep writing cubed? Into x squared plus three, that's gonna give us four. Four is larger than zero. Also, I feel like I'm talking very fast. So if I'm going too fast, tell me to slow down. So four is greater than zero. So we've essentially shown algebraically that x cubed, why? <laughs> x squared plus three is on top. Um, again, you can always draw it and just look at it graphically. So, oh my goodness. So essentially the thing we want to calculate here, how did I get four? Mm -hmm. So I'm working on the interval zero to six. So I, I pick a point between zero and six, whatever point makes me happiest. So I chose X equals one. Mm -hmm. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that X equals one and plug it into both functions. So I'm going on that interval zero to six, pick whatever number makes you happy. You could have picked one, two, three, four, five, one half, 1.75, you know, whatever number makes you happy, and you plug it into both equations. The two equations we're working with are x cubed plus 3 and y equals 0. So when I plug 1 into y equals 0, there's no x value there, so there's nowhere to plug in. So I get 0. And then when I plug in 1 to x cubed, oh my god, x squared plus 3, 1 squared is 1 plus 3 is 4. That makes sense. Okay. Um, again, you can graph it as well. How to see it on like the graph? Uh, whoops, that's not what I want. So if we were to graph this, stop it. Goodness, no, go over here. <laughs> If we were to graph, oh my lord. <laughs> if we were to graph this, it would look something like this. Now we only care about zero to six, so we're only caring about, you know, this much, like the right side, if you will. So remember, we're looking for which functions on top of the other, and we're comparing this function to the x-axis. So in comparison to, you know, the x-axis down here, and the function, which is up there, which one's on top? Well, the function's on top. Because we're comparing it to the y-axis. X-axis, sorry. But the x-axis is all the way down there. Hopefully that's what you meant, Jackson, by how to see that in a calculator. Um, but if it's not, let me know. So essentially what we found now is that they didn't intersect at all, so we didn't have to split up this integral. They gave us the uh, interval from 0 to 6. So that means we want to calculate the integral from 0 to 6. Now remember, it's always top function minus bottom function. So here, what we just found was we found that the x squared plus 3 was on top. So we have x squared plus 3 minus our bottom function of 0. I know when we're using the y, uh, x axis, it, it seems a little silly to do the minus 0, but let's just keep it there to make sure we do the process correctly. Now remember, at this point in time, on these types of questions, this is when you can use your calculator. Remember, you do need to know how to do integrals by hand, the one we just, one we just did up here. Um, but at this point, for these area types of questions, once you get here, you can punch it into your calculator. Just in case someone has a calculator who can't do it, or you just want some more practice with um, um, doing these by hand, I'm going to do it out fully. Um, Victoria's the x on top because so because the y value turned out to be bigger, um, which is hopefully what you mean. So when I plugged in that x value of one, my y value of four in that function is larger than zero. So since the y value is larger for the x squared plus three, that means it's on top. So if I want to do this by hand, 
we would find our antiderivative first. So we'd have x cubed over three. We're bringing out as one third, because remember that would be an add one to the power, divide by the new power type of situation. Antiderivative of three is three x. Yeah, it's the button. It's like the second row, second column, the, the one right here. It's now highlighted in red on, uh, on the screen. I'll leave that up for a couple of seconds. It's like right next to the alpha. Um, and then the antiderivative of zero is still just zero. It would technically be zero x, but zero times x is zero. So plus c from zero to six. So if we're doing this by hand, we would plug in our top bound. Subtract what you get when you plug in the bottom bound. So what the heck is six cubed? <laughs> so it'd be 216 over three plus 18 minus zero. OK. Um, and let me go one step further just in case like if this was a. Uh, actually, wait a minute. 216 divided by 3 is a nice number. So that would reduce to 72. So hopefully, oh yeah, the answer is 90 <laughs> for that one, um, which is hopefully what you would get when you plug it into your calculator. So area, find where they intersect. If they don't intersect, cool, then you just don't care. Um, and then, so if, it do, if they don't intersect, then they must have given you two numbers to go between. Um, and here they did from zero to six. So we needed to figure out which one was on top of the other. Do it either graphically by looking at the graphs or um, algebraically by picking a number between the two bounds that you're working with. Plug that number into both equations. Whatever has the larger, larger y value is your top function. Do your integral top minus bottom. Yeah, we can do one of those if they do. Yeah, so let me just. <laughs> oh, Kayla, before it gets lost in the chat. Um, yeah, Kayla, it's just five and six that are on the exam because the chapter four stuff was still on derivatives and I just want this exam to be um, integral and Riemann some stuff. Um, is he here yet? No. Zach, um, are you having an SI session slash do you know when that's going to be? Cool. Yeah, so um, I'll be having my regular SI session tomorrow night. Uh, and that's going to be at five o'clock, uh, you know, usual time. Uh, it won't be a, a test review like we usually have, which is two hours. It'll just be a regular SI session. So it'll only be 50 minutes, um, but I'm going to try to, you know, take as many questions as I can. And if there's any topics that people are having troubles with, uh, I'm pretty much just going to focus on whatever the students want to focus on. Um, also remember, y'all can go to whatever SI sessions you want. Um, and if you Google the SI sessions, my other SI who covers my other class is Emily Heeb. Um, so if you want someone who's specifically to my content and how much I've covered and she knows that I have an exam coming up this week, um, if Zach's doesn't work for you, you can also try to check out Emily. Um, so that's it. Thanks, Zach. OK. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to keep track of what people have said before, before it gets lost in chat. Right, Kayla, no number lines. OK, so we want some examples of where they do intersect. Sure, let's. It's not a good idea for me to get one off the top of my head, so let me try to only see. That one would work. Okay. So let's do. No, let's do. Let's do one where it's not the x axis. Um, I shouldn't come up with these off the top of my head, so just one second. 
I'm going to find one that comes out to be not completely terrible. Let's do that one. Uh, no, that's not going to work. Well, no, I can do that. Okay, cool. Let's do that. So I'm going to change this question up a little bit, but let's find the area bounded by uh, y equals 4x minus x squared and y equals 3 on, um, let's go 0. You know what? Let's go 0 to 4. It's going to step it up the tiniest bit, but we'll take it slow. <laughs> It'll be all right. OK, so today I want to find the area bounded by these two functions. So. First thing we need to do is we need to enter, find where they intersect. So we have 4x minus x squared equals 3. Um, I like having my x squareds be positive, so I'm going to swing everything over to the right. So I'm going to add x squared over to the other side, subtract 4x, and then the 3 just kind of stayed on that side. So now we want to try to find when this quadratic is zero. You can, of course, use the quadratic formula if you want. But um, this is factorable. So two numbers that multiply to three and add to negative four. So technically, the only numbers that multiply to three are three and one, but we would need them both to be negative in this case. So this will factor into x minus one and x my whoops minus three minus three minus three. So this one's going to end up having a lot of intervals. Um, we haven't done one with this many integrals intervals before. It's the same process. It's just you have to do it in a lot more pieces. So I think it's a good review question. But anyway, um, so this is going to happen either when x minus one is zero or x minus three equals zero. So we get x equals one and x equals three. So notice that both of those numbers are inside of the interval we're working over is 0 to 4. Remember, if they're not, you just don't care about them. But since they're both inside of the interval 0 to 4, we're going to have to break it up. Now, this is what I meant by this has more pieces than usual that we've done before, because usually we would just split it up into two pieces. But this is actually going to split up into three pieces. No, one, yeah, three pieces. Because we need to split it up at 1 and at 3. So essentially what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up, we need to start at zero because that's where we're told to start. Go, go, why is all this stuff coming up? Go away, go away, go, go away. There we go. From zero to one, from one to three, and then from three to four. So I'm going to do it algebraically and then I'll draw the graphs. But essentially, these are the three intervals that we need to break it up over. So we're going to have to calculate three integrals. Oh. -ho. So oh, I made my life a little difficult because there's no nice number there. I need to pick a number between zero and one. I guess one half is the nicest thing I can pick. I've got to plug them into both functions. The one function is y equals three, which is essentially just give me going to give me three yeah, no matter what. And then we have 4x minus x squared, which is going to give us something. I don't even know what that is. Um, so 4 times 1 half minus 1 half squared is 1.75. Remember, the point of these is to figure out which number is larger. So which one of those two numbers is larger? Well, three is so that means y equals three is going to be on top in the first interval then we're going to do the same thing so between one and three pick a number between one and three i'm going to pick two plug it into both functions again y equals three is just always going to give us three 
And then if we plug 2 into 4x minus x squared, I'm going to get 4. So now the 4x minus x squared is on top. And again, I think I've said this before, don't assume that they're going to switch. Sometimes they don't. Um, it's very often that they will switch. There are very few situations where it won't switch, but don't just assume that it does. And then we need to pick a number between 3 and 4, so I guess 3 and a half. We plug that into y equals 3. Again, that's just always going to give us 3. We plug it into 4x minus x squared. We get 1.75 again. I guess this is kind of a symmetric-ish function. but So that means our y equals 3 is going to be back on top. Um, our graph of this, if you like to do these graphically instead, looks like this. That's very slanty line. Whoosh. That's a little off, but gets the point across. And so this is one, x equals one. This is x equals three. Um, so we're going from, you know, x, uh, x equals zero to x equals four. So we have that y equals three is on top, and then the parabola is on top, and then y equals three is on top again. So we're not done, but I'm going to pause for a second. <laughs> So now we found we're working over three intervals, so we're going to need three integrals. We've now found which function is on top in each piece. So now we essentially just need to write them down and hopefully have a calculator we can plug it into. <laughs> so we'll have an integral. Whoops, let me switch back. From zero to one. From one to three. And then from three to four. And remember, we're always doing top minus bottom. So in the first interval from 0 to 1, y equals 3 was on top. So we have our top function was 3. Our bottom function was 4x minus x squared. Here is one case where it would be very important to have those parentheses around that bottom function. I would suggest possibly just putting it always around a bottom function, even if it's something silly like just a 0 just to get used to it, because if you don't have the parentheses there, you're going to get the wrong answer. In the second interval, 4x minus x squared was on top, so our top minus bottom looks like not that. 4x minus x squared minus 3. And I'll put 3 in parentheses, just to kind of do what I was just saying. And then in the last interval, 3 turned out on top again. So top minus bottom would look like that. And then again, hopefully, <laughs> you just have a calculator you can punch this into. Um, if anyone wants me to do it by hand, or at least show the antiderivative, I can. But otherwise, I'm just going to punch it into my calculator. But just let me know. And if you want to see the antiderivative or whatever else, no. That's not right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the last, the last one's probably gonna be the same thing then. Is that what makes sense? <laughs> yeah, it is. All right. Now, technically, if you rounded, you'd get three point like nine ish. But um, technically, these are all four thirds, four thirds, four thirds, four thirds. And if you add all of them up uh, in terms of like a fraction, you get twelve thirds, which is four. Um, one thing I want to say is 
Um, say you were given this question, but you weren't given an interval to work on, you can still do this, even if you're not given that interval. What you would then do is you would just form it with the two pieces that you get when you set them equal to each other. So if it just said find the area bounded by 4x minus x squared and x equal, and sorry, 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 I can't read. If it just said find the area bounded by y equals 4x minus x squared and y equals 3 and it stopped, you would just be using 1 and 3 as your bounds since that's what we used to, that's where we found that they intersect. So if it doesn't give you an interval, you form one using the intersection points. Okay. Or sometimes it'll only give you half an interval, like it'll say on x greater than or equal to zero, and then you stop at the intersection point. So if you're not given an interval, the intersection points come become even more important than usual. So Um, they should already be there. Let me triple check, but I did them last night. Mm, yeah, they're there. They're there already. Um, they're in the exact same spot as the blank review. Um, so maybe that threw, threw some people off, but the review answers are up on Blackboard. Um, it's just I put them where I put the blank reviews and now there's like two PDFs in them. I also wrote EM3 review instead of exam3 review. Anyway, so answers are up on Blackboard. There we go. OK, um, so that's that. Um, in terms of. Let me just see. Do, do, do. Oh, there's a random ring in some question on your homework. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. Um, okay, so for the most part, that goes over most of the homework types of questions, except this type of question. Um, so let me go over one like this. Let me try to think of one off the top of my head. Um, nope. Whoops. Yeah, let's get rid of approximately zero. Let's just do positive or negative. Um, let me see. Oh, I gotta be a little careful with my drawing. So one, two, three, four, five. Um, I don't really care about y values though. I guess I can just. Um, let's do. Oh no, I should break this. <laughs> no, that's going to be bad. <laughs> um, here, let's just do this. Sorry about that. There we go. Uh, that looks really stupid, especially at one, but let's pretend that doesn't look dumb. That's a little better. <laughs> and so I wanted to talk about, uh, let's do, <laughs> uh, so this function is f of x. Uh, let's do, da, da, da. and let's do, dish. Here we go. Oh, 
Victoria, no, no, no. Five four and five five are not on the exam. No, no, no. I put those um, up because if there weren't any questions, we we're gonna we were gonna start that today. Not that it was gonna be on your test, but we were just gonna start it for the sake of time. But no, 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 no. I saw it. I saw it on your test. <laughs> um, so say I wanted to determine if the following are approximately positive or negative. Um, so here. If we're going from negative two to one, well, that's kind of that first blip that's above the x-axis. So remember, in terms of a regular integral, area above the x-axis is positive and area below the x-axis is negative. So since all of that area ends up above the x-axis, this would probably be positive. Well, not, po not probably, it would be positive. But then if instead we're looking from one to three, all of the area from one to three is below the x-axis, so in general, any area below the x-axis is going to be treated as negative. Now from negative 2 to 5, we have some area that's above the x-axis and some area that's below the x-axis. Now that last area that's above the x-axis is probably about the same amount. Well, I tried to make it about the same amount as the one that's underneath the x-axis. So those would most likely end up canceling each other out. But even if they didn't, there's so much area above the x-axis in that first piece that there's no way this could end up being negative. There's way more area above the x-axis than below the x-axis. So this would most likely end up being positive. Again, not even really most likely, but. The other type of thing you can do with these types of questions is the following. Um, now I want to change this just slightly. It's not going to change the answers to the things I just did, but let's just make this a little bigger for. So I know I just said that things were going to cancel each other out, but that doesn't change any of the answers that I just wrote down. So the other thing I could do with these types of questions is I could essentially actually give you the value. Um, now these values are not to scale, but let's go ahead and say let's change that to seven and let's make this. Three. <laughs> Um, so I could actually give you the values of those areas. Actually, sorry, that value would probably be given to you as a positive two, and you would just have to realize that it's going to turn into a negative. So if I wanted to do these exact same questions, well then the integral from negative from negative two to one, sorry, um, would be seven because that's the area that I'm telling you is in that first piece. And then from one to three, I'm telling you that the amount of stuff there is two, but since it's below the X axis, you would have to make it a negative two. So a lot of times the numbers will be given to you as positives, but you have to remember that anything that ends up below the X axis is negative. And then if I wanted to figure out the area from negative two to five, well, I start with that piece of seven at the back. And then if I want to add on the area from one to three, well, I need to remember that that's negative two. And then I can add on the area from three to five, which is three. So that total area would end up being eight. So I can also kind of tell you the values of the areas um, and ask you to find them from there. And yes, there will be something similar to that on the exam. I could also ask you to find the areas yourself if the areas are areas that you should be able to find the area of. So say I gave you, um, you know, a graph that was like this, you know, negative five T and we're going to uh, five. No, uh, brain, 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 brain. Why is my brain not working? Oh, because I'm dumb, right? <laughs> Negative five T plus five is what that would be. There we go. <laughs> no, it wouldn't, it would be a one. But that would be up a five. Yes, it would. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> I should never think of things off the top of my head. So this is obviously not to scale because that X value goes up to one and the Y values are five. So that's not a scale thing. But say I wanted you to then estimate the integral from, so actually let me pretend that I don't know what this function is and I just call it f of x. I could ask you the integral from 0 to 1 of f of x, which would be this area here, but that's a, I almost said rectangle, but that's a triangle, 
So you can find the area of a triangle by doing one half base times height. So the area would be five halves, so that would be into, uh, equal to the integral. So I can also ask you questions like that where you have a known shape that you can use to find the area. And so then you'll use that known shape. Um, so the exam is going to be very, very similar to the last two. You know, there's a multiple choice section. There's a full answer section kind of deal. Um, the area stuff is very complicated, Kayla, I will be quite honest. Well, maybe I should avoid the word complicated. It's a long process is what I'll say. Um, we've got eight more minutes. Is there anything else specific that people wanted to see or you just want to see another type of example of ones we've already gone over? So the main the main topics on the exam are Raymond sums, um, antiderivatives, which kind of tie into integrals. So antiderivatives and integrals and these area questions. Sure. Um, so I assume you mean we're just given a table and we want to find left or right hand sums. Um, oh Lord, it doesn't matter. Let's do two. Oh no, it does kind of matter. Okay, let's let me be careful. <laughs> Um, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just do that. Uh, two, seven, three, four, ten, uh, eight, five. Sure. I never quit heard my regular exam. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, you have this exam and a final exam, and then you're done. Let's do a right hand sum and a left hand sum. Using, hmm, let's do three rectangles. Remember rectangles and sub intervals. That wording is a uh, kind of interchangeable. So now we need to be careful because sometimes with these tables like this one that I just wrote, you don't need to use all of the values. So I'm asking us to use three rectangles here. Now we're going between zero and six, so you want to use the entire length of the table. So we need to go from zero to six, but essentially if we're going from zero to six and splitting it up into three pieces, 6 divided by 3 is 2, so essentially each interval we're working over should have a width of 2. So we're working over these three intervals. So essentially the only numbers we care about, we don't care about 1, we don't care about 3, and we don't care about 5. So there's almost too much data on this table. So now if we want to find the right hand and the left hand sum, well remember we're essentially having a width and then a bunch of lengths. So if I want to take my, let me do my right hand side first. Well, the width of the rectangles of the sub intervals I'm working over, that's two because it's the distance between these numbers and the intervals. So our width is two, and now I need to find all my heights, all my lengths, whatever you prefer to call them. So since this is a right hand sum, we're going to use the values, the Y values at the right hand endpoints. So we're going to use our Y value at two which was three, our y value at four, which was 10, and our y value at six, which was five. So three plus 10 plus five times two is 36. I'll hold on for a second before I do the left side. And then the left hand side, the width stays that whoop, shouldn't have done that. The widths are gonna stay the same because we're still working over the same types of intervals. But now we're using the y values at the left side of these sub intervals. So we're using the y value at zero, so two, the y value at two, so three, and the y value at four, so ten. So this would be 30. 
So we multiply by two. Um, so remember what we're technically doing here. Um, this is not what this set of data looks like. Well, it's lagging a little bit. Um, is we're essentially finding rectangles and finding their areas. So Two, three, four. So the area um, of a rectangle, remember, this is essentially length times width. So we're essentially taking the area of rectangle one, rectangle two, rectangle three, rectangle four. Um, but they're all a length times a width. Now, I should be very careful. Some of them have, they have different lengths. But they all have the same width. We specifically take them to have the same width. I'll pull that out. Whoops. So I'm multiplying b by two because that's my width of my rectangles and the width of the rectangles is the same as the width as the, of the sub intervals. And since the sub intervals are going from zero to two, two to four and four to six, the width of that interval is two. So that's why I've got to multiply by two. Hopefully that. Um, graph questions? Um, Victoria, do you mean like the ones I just started talking about before we did this one? Is that what you mean by graph questions? Um, Jay, um, I crossed those out because we weren't going to need them. So notice that the intervals I'm working over are 0 to 2, 2 to 4, and 4 to 6. So that means I didn't need the values at 1, 3, and 5. I didn't need to cross them out. Um, I just crossed them out because I felt like it, <laughs> uh, because we weren't going to need them. So I tried to clear it up a little bit that we weren't going to need to use those because they weren't part of our intervals. So I just crossed them out for giggles. The area of a graph. Um, I mean, there's not going to be a ton of those because they take so long. Um, but we have two more minutes, so I can try to do another one. Um, but any more questions on this one real quick? OK, um, let me try to do one more area question real quick. Um, let's do find area as under uh, x squared minus 25 on x is greater than or equal to zero. Let's do that. Um, sometimes you'll see the word total area. So Jackson, if that said use as many as possible, we would essentially have been going from 0 to 1, 1 to 2, 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5, 5 to 6. Um, so essentially, the only thing that would change there is that your width would now be 1. And for your left-hand side, You'd be using 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Well, the y values associated there. Maybe I should have drawn circles around the y values. And then for the right hand side, you use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Um, so the process is kind of the same as just you're using more sub intervals, but you still choose the right endpoint or the left hand point, depending on which. Um, one you're looking over. So if I write these out super duper quick. Um, this would be 1, 2 plus 7 plus 3 plus 4 plus 10 plus 8. 1, 7 plus 3 plus 4 plus 10 plus 8 plus 5. Um, so that actually, we're out of time. Um, Victoria, if you can stay, I can do that last one that I just wrote down. Um, but if you have to leave, uh, you may do so, um, but I'll do this one really quick for those who can stick around. Um, don't feel like you need to stick around at all. Um, so here we would want to, so the total area essentially gets us that we're working with y equals zero. So you have to find where they intersect. Technically we'll get positive or negative five here when we square root it. Now we're given part of an interval here. We're given X is greater than or equal to zero. So we don't care about the negative. We only care about positive five. 
Now, since here we're not given a full interval, we're not told where to stop. We're going to stop at that intersection point. So we're going to take that intersection point and essentially make it our stopping point. Yeah, I'll post this um, when I get a chance. So the uh, we've been recording, so the recording will be up when I get a chance, when it gets compiled and all that jazz. And I can even put the uh, the notes that I've been writing down up on Blackboard. You can do that later. So we're working from zero to five. So if I want to find which one's on top, I have to pick a number between zero and five, or you can graph it, but let me do it algebraically really quick. So plugging that into zero will, of course, get you zero. And then x squared minus 25, if I plug in one, which was the number that I chose, um, I'll get negative 24. So y equals zero will be on top, which does make sense, because if you graph it, it'll look like this. Um, so if we're working between you know, zero and five, so we're working just in this piece in here, the x-axis is on top. So we're going from zero, that's a really big integral symbol, <laughs> from zero to five. Our top function was zero. Our bottom function was x squared minus 25. So of course, at this point, you can punch that into your calculator, or if you wish to do it by hand, I would reduce it to this first. And then you can find the antiderivative, plug in the top bound, subtract what you get when you plug in the bottom bound. Questions, concerns on that? Um, I've got to go get ready for my next class, um, but like I said to Jay, 